Hi everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Sci, the art and science of watch collection. Uh, today we're going to talk about Breguet watches. Um, this is a this is a is a topic that could go on forever and ever, and so I, I want to provide a context for one of the most famous names in watchmaking. Okay, well. Uh, let's get started. Uh, the name of the great watchmaker was Abraham Louis Breguet. Uh, he lived from 1747 to 1823. And uh, Breguet watches uh, was started in 1775. So it's one of the very earliest. Breguet was, was born in 1747 in uh, Neuchâtel, uh, Switzerland. And the reason he was born in Switzerland is that you, you have to know a little about the, the, the French wars of religion. Um, I made a video about this, explain how uh, Switzerland became the, uh, the center for watchmaking in Europe. Uh, it's uh, video number 16. This will help, and then I won't have to explain a whole lot about it. Louis the Fourteenth did a great deal for France, but he also sort of reintroduce the wars of religion because he had the revocation of the uh, the Edict of Nantes, so it was, uh, they wanted everyone to be a Catholic. This is sort of the context that the Breguet family came to be in Switzerland. When he grew up, Breguet was, had sort of a hobby, more like uh, mechanics than anything else, and he, he, his father sent him to uh, Paris to uh, actually, it was Versailles to become a learn how to be a watchmaker, and uh, actually it was his stepfather, who himself was was a watchmaker. So he gets there and he gets in with the right crowd, and the right crowd at that time were people who had a connection with the uh, French royalty uh, during that period, and they really really liked uh, Louis Breguet's stuff, and so they made him a, a royal. Uh, Holographer. Some of the inventions that he had. Now, there's a lot of back and forth about this. Uh, and by back and forth, what I mean is that some of the inventions may have already existed and uh, Breguet simply perfected them. Uh, that's probably the best way of putting it. Others he invented from scratch. For example, the uh, self-winding uh, watch was one that he's often been credited for, with. And apparently, though, there was somebody else before him who did it, and but he was the one who uh, I think was considered the guy who perfected it. Same with the chronometer. Um, he had made one that was so good that he became the uh, holographer for the French Navy, and they adopted his chronographer. The one thing that he did invent that was truly his was the uh, two-dimensional tourbillon. And it was truly a work of art. And so that was, that was Breguet's. Another thing I think that was all his too was a constant force escapement that he uh, developed. Uh, another was the um, uh, resonance watch. Uh, this is my resonance watch by F.P. Journe. Uh, who is who is French, by the way, but uh, has his operation in Geneva. The resonance watch was actually was a resonance clock, and I I'm pretty sure that his implementation was such that it was one that worked. And and in looking at this, you can see a lot of influence there. I mean, a whole lot, not just a little, but a great deal of influence that uh, F. P. Jorn had from Breguet. Uh, another thing, and again, we take this for granted, is the uh, keyless winding. And so we just wind it up with a crown and don't think anything about it, but I used to have to have a key to wind it up with. Okay, so those are, those are just some of the things. And again, uh, whether he was actually the first on some of these or not isn't as important as the fact that his were spectacularly good. The another uh, thing that he did, he had, and to me, this is important. He had influence on a lot of the other watchmakers. 
and watchmaking still today. Uh, here's a, a picture of a Vassaron Constantin Historique, uh, uh, American 1921, That's one of my watches, and it has Breguet hands on it. Now, I, when I first read about the you know, Breguet hands being an invention, I thought, okay, big deal. You know, he puts little balls at the end of that. Well, it turned out to be little more than that because what was happening was that when they, the hands they used to have were these big club-like things, and the the real skinny ones uh, were hard to see. And so by creating them with this little, they call them moons or circles or whatever you want to call them, near the end, uh, they became, you could still have these more delicate uh, hands on it and uh, also, and then the round end on it. Also, it's a beautiful, it's just a gorgeous uh, looking hand. So anyway, here's some Breguet hands on uh, on my uh, Vassaron Constantin. Now, during the period he was there, the <laughs> the watchmakers were on a dock, and it was called the Coudelons. And it, it was on a, a part of uh, an island in in the middle of the Seine in Paris called the Ile de la Cité. And here, this is where, if you've ever been uh, there, uh, you probably visited uh, Notre Dame because it's on the same little island. But it, the, in this circle area is the uh, Cura de Lone. And here, this is where not only was Breguet, but Jacques uh, Droz, Ferdinand uh, Berthoud, uh, Jean-Antoine Lapine, and uh, Julien Leray. Um, these guys, or what they were, they were, they were as much cooperative as they were competitive. And so someone says, hey, you know, this guy wants this, this kind of movement. They'd all say, oh, wow, that sounds really cool. Let's all work on it. And they did. And they developed a lot of the early horology uh, on the coup de l'Ange. Now, what happened was that there was a French Revolution. And here was the part of the problem is that Breguet was like, his stuff was so good, the, all the royalties uh, loved his stuff. Well, that was fine, but when the, when the French Revolution came, uh, Breguet and a lot of these other guys who had done so well with the royalty uh, were, you know, scheduled for the guillotine. So uh, Breguet, uh, got out of Dodge really quickly. He ran, he went back to uh, Switzerland uh, until things cooled down. Uh, now, when he came back, uh, he was, uh, this is during the, the Napoleonic era. Okay, this is, a, again, post the post-terrors uh, period in, um, in France and in Paris. Now, here there was, a, the revolution wasn't just for just for the democracy that was coming into France, but it was also considered a huge threat to these other uh, European royalties. Um, uh, this included uh, Austria, uh, Prussia, the Netherlands, and of course, England, uh, and Spain. So uh, Napoleon, though, being Napoleon, he was quite good, had a great big army, and uh, of course he conquered and was <laughs> quite, quite successful. Well, it, what happened was that Breguet had decided to, that there was a good clientele in Russia. And so he opened up a, a shop in uh, St. Petersburg. And he was there for about three years. And he was doing pretty well until the Tsar said, wait a minute, you know, you're, you're, uh, you know, you're part of, you're French, so we're throwing all the French out of here. And it was basically because of Napoleon. Now, one of the, one of the funny stories is that uh, the Tsar liked Breguet's watches so much that incognito, he came into Breguet, uh, to Breguet's shop <laughs> in, in uh, Paris and asked him to make some watches for him, <laughs> which, is, which is, to me, uh, was pretty funny. I'll give you an idea of the kind of reputation he had and the quality of watches. You know, but let's jump ahead. Now, we, the next thing we come to is Lamania because Lamania is a movement maker that became what is called manufactured Breguet. In other words, this is sort of Breguet's in-house movement. Um, the 
here, this Lamania really started in 1884 uh, by a guy named uh, Alfred Lugren. And he formed Lugren SA. And then in 1930, uh, somebody who bought it or inherited it decided to call it, I think it was one of the relatives of Lugren. So now let's give it a cooler name. <laughs> so they call it Lamania. Uh, this is in 1930. Now, what happened in 1932, uh, they decided to get together with Omega and Tissot and form something called the SSIH group. And the during that time, uh, Lamania made the movements for both Omega and Tissot, which means that Lamania made the famous uh, movement for the Moonwatch uh, for Omega. And so this is another thing that I didn't know about it, but yeah, that was, they were making all of the movements for Omega and Tissot at the time. All right, now, post-Quartz crisis, uh, when everybody, all of them are going under, uh, what happened in 1980, Lamania separated from SSIH, first of all. Second, uh, they became Novel Lamania. And then, um, in 1992, Breguet bought uh, Novel Lamania, and uh, then in 1999, Swatch bought Breguet. Well, Lamania was part of Breguet at that time, and so they got it too. Uh, Lamania never really became part of ETA. Uh, they all they had been they had they were part of Breguet sort of it was a Breguet Lamania thing and so they I think the people run on SWATs decided it was a good idea to keep them together and uh, they also wanted to sort of add the status of having an in-house movement and so they renamed Lamania Manufacturing Breguet and so when we see the modern day movements that Breguet has are really sort of the, the, you can trace the roots back to Lamania, but they're now a uh, manufacturer brigade. Okay, um, so let's take a look at the watches that um, Brigade makes. These are the different models. Uh, the first one is the tradition, and the tradition is the ones that they have a lot of the mechanically interesting aspects to. Uh, classic is classic both in terms of design and just sort of the overall look and also having excellence in their uh, in their movements. Again, just going back to uh, where you have sort of the DNA of Lamania under the movements. The next two that they have uh, is that you have the, in addition to the classic, you have the classic complication. Now this is where you have a lot of the turbions and some of the other more complex uh, elements. These are extremely expensive watches. I don't think any of the classic complications, even on on your uh, gray markets are under $100,000 or they're crazy expensive. The Marine really for uh, more for the yachtsmen than the divers. Okay, uh, the the next one now the type. This is I don't know what they were thinking when they were naming these things, but this turned out to be type twenty, twenty one, and twenty two, and then they have them in Roman numerals. Now these are your sports watches, and a, these are very cool, very popular uh, watch. Uh, very competitive with Omegas and Rolexes and so uh, And so you have a sort of an upscale uh, sports model. The Heritage, uh, here you have your Heritage. It's, it's more your formal watch. Uh, the, the one shown there has their Tourneau shape to it. That, that's another interesting series, the kind of thing more that I, I tend to like. <laughs> All right, uh, next uh, we have some ladies watches, but the watches that are designed primarily for women uh, are two, the Rhine de Naples and the uh, high jewelry watches. And they're just gorgeous. Uh, <laughs> they're drowning in diamonds, but they are in other jewels and gold and platinum and 
all of these precious metals and they're gorgeous. That's about the only thing I can say. I can't talk about the affordability because I can't even think about how much they cost. Okay, um, one of the things that I that is that I always like to look at are the awards that uh, the watches have got in Grand Prix to Oral OG. And I gotta tell you, the ones <laughs> that Breguet won, I've never seen a stranger sort of kaleidoscope of awards. Now, in 2002, they won the uh, Ladies' Watch Prize that was something like that really gorgeous Ryan Day uh, to Naples. Uh, and then uh, in 2003, they won a public prize, and the watch they had only had a reference number. It didn't have a name to it. Then in 2005, they got a special jury prize for the tradition uh, Brigade uh, 7027. Special jury prizes really are special jury prizes. They're, they see a watch, they say, wow, this watch is just amazing. But it didn't fit in any of the other categories, and, and so oftentimes they'll give it a special jury prize. It sort of was... It wasn't quite a, you know, the men's watch wasn't complicated. It was, they just, well, let's see, well, we're going to call it, we're going to give it a special jury prize. And then in 2006 and 2014, again, they have uh, public prizes. So half of the prizes they want are public prizes. Now, the public prizes, they, and for 2017, they're not going to have it, <laughs> at least for this year. I don't know if they're going to bring it back or not. Uh, and the public prize is basically a popularity contest. So I guess they must be awfully popular for them to win, win the public prize. Now, and then, okay, so here you have all of these strange prizes that they have. The, the ladies actually is, the, is not, I mean, that's sort of like a straight kind of Grand Prix award. And the other ones are these either public or the special jury or something different. But then in 2014, a few years ago, they won the Eguida Or, which is like the grand, grand prize. Audemars Piguet has won more of Grand Prix awards than any other watch company, but they have never won, not once, the Eguida Or. They've never won the grand prize. And so... Here's Breguet with all of these strange <laughs> prizes that they won. And then they come up with a classic uh, chronometer. Uh, that's the one pictured. And they win the, the top award. So it, it, you know, it's, it's an interesting company. It really is. By and large, um, the reason that a lot of collectors don't have a lot of Breguets is because they're, they tend to be fairly expensive. I think the uh, Type X, the sports watches, they're more popular, and they have more of those that are in um, stainless steel. Uh, the price of gold has just gone nuts. I think it's over $1,200 an ounce now, uh, which is <laughs> really a lot. In fact, this is the first time that I've ever seen gold surpass the price of platinum. So, hey, if, you, if you've been wanting a platinum watch, now's the time when the price is down. It's not down. It's just not as high as gold. So, Breguet, I, uh, I, I find them fascinating, and I'd really like to hear your opinion. What do you think of Breguet? Here's this, this, I mean, I don't think there's a watch collector who doesn't know, haven't heard of Breguet, but there aren't a lot of them who have Breguet watches. Uh, the ones I've run into love them. They absolutely love the brigades that they have. And um, if you, there's a lot of fiction. Uh, there is this one series, one of my favorite uh, series back uh, from the 80s or 90s. It was called about a, a Napoleonic soldier. Uh, well, it was a it was a soldier during the Napoleonic Wars in uh, England called Sharp. And the Sharp series was uh, by Bernard Cornwell. They mentioned. Uh, having brigades. Now, this is the English, okay, uh, talking about their officers having a brigade watch. A lot of fiction, you'll, you'll run into brigade, which is sort of interesting. It's like, boy, that's, a, that's one of the top watches. Okay, please leave a comment. I'd love to hear what you have to say. And if you'd like this as an invitation to subscribe. Until 
Sunday when we have, I think we have a very, very interesting collection or um, review on, on Sunday. Uh, very different from the other collections that we reviewed. So I think you're going to find it interesting. Till then, this has been Bill Sanders for Watch Art Sci, the art and science of Watts collection. Thank you.